Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's Hyperloop seminar. Um, thank you for joining and tuning in today. We have one interesting talk today by Luca Rufe. He's a Swiss Loop student and he studies electrical engineering in his master's at ETH Zurich. And today he's telling us about the sensor network architecture for Hyperloop infrastructure and vehicles. And yes, um, I'd like to hand over to you, Luca, and or maybe I can tell about the Slido tool again. Maybe you can go one slide forward. So um, we use the website um, slido.com and there you can enter your uh, the seminar code VEC Transport Seminar and then you can actively um, type in your questions. And at the end, we go through all the questions and Luca is happy to answer them at the end. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So I'd like to hand over to you, Luca, and thank you for your contribution to the seminar. Of course. So then uh, I'm going to begin. My name, as Natalie already said, is Luca Rufer. I study electrical engineering at HJ Zurich. Uh, I'm currently finishing up on my bachelor's degree and have started on my master's degree. Um, my relationship to, relationship to Swiss Loop um, in 2019 and 20, I was uh, a focus student at the Swiss Loop project. I was responsible for the sensors, vehicle control, external communication, and data logging. And for the new season, Swiss Loop 2020 2021, I'm doing a semester thesis on a sensor network. And that's, this is the topic I'm going to present to you now. So uh, let's start with this slide here. <laughs> Uh, as you can see here, this is the team 2020. Uh, this is the pod that we built and this pod has a lot of sensors. Um, as you can see here, there are some sensors that are safety relevant, like position and velocity sensors, like this big sensor in the middle here or the smaller sensor at the back here. There are also safety relevant um, sensors like the brake pressure that needs to be monitored, so the brake can be engaged at all time. And there are also sensors used for optimization like brake temperature, forces that act on the wheels um, and forces that act on the limb. So that, uh, that's all that needs to be monitored. So for a larger and more integrated vehicle, these are a lot of sensors. The architecture that was used in previous years by Swiss Loop is a so-called star topology. A star topology is a topology where you have a central controller or something like that um, and every other system is directly connected to that central controller. In our case, this central controller is the main PCB which uh, controls the vehicle and every sensor is directly connected to that PCB. This topology has the advantage that it is pretty simple and easy to implement because you just need to have a cable from every sensor to that main PCB and you can communicate with every sensor individually. So you don't have like crosstalk between the sensors or that they interfere with each other. The disadvantage is that you need a really large PCB because you have a lot of connectors and also that you have uh, to add a lot of cable because for every single sensor you have to have a single, a single cable. So if for example you have 10 sensors in the front which are two meters away from the main PCB you need 10 times two meters of cable. And this adds up to quite a lot of cable and weight and also quite a lot of cost. So it is um, easier to have another topology as I will show you later. Additionally, it is not adjustable. So once you have defined all your connectors and cables and sensors, it is not possible to add or yes, it is possible to remove a sensor, but it is not possible to add more sensors because you already fixed your hardware. And it is also not scalable because if you would like to add 50 sensors to that PCB, that P PCB would just like be a meter long or something like that. So to give you an example of what this looks like, this is the main vehicle control uh, board that we used in 2020 uh, from top view and bottom view. And as you can see, it has a lot of connectors to connect to all the sensors that are listed here. Of course, some of the sensors can be combined to a single cable, but this is not always the case. So a better topology that I based my um, thesis on is the so-called linear bus topology. In a linear bus topology, you have 
um, a single cable where everything is connected to. The advantage is that you only need one connector to the bus for every node. And you also have a single cable. So we can just have one cable from the front of the vehicle to the back of the vehicle, and that's all. You can also add or remove sensors at any time because the, you just need to have a connection to that cable and then you can just plug in another sensor. It's also scalable, so you can have a few dozen sensors on that bus uh, without a problem and without having a cable that is, yeah, or too many cables that just mess up the pod or the vehicle. Um, the downside of this topology is that it requires synchronization of the nodes. Um, so before every communication to every sensor could be handled individually, with a linear bus topology, only one sensor can send data at a time. So this um, communication has to be synchronized. And another downside is that you require an adapter for the sensor. In a star topology, you can just add uh, every sensor directly. In a linear bus topology, you need an adapter if not all the sensors are uh, compatible with each other. As an example, not every sensor has the same supply voltage or produces the same format of data. There are some sensors that produce um, an analog signal, like a current output or a voltage output. Some sensors have a digital interface, um, which they use to communicate. Um, and to have everything on the same bus, you need a communication protocol. Um, also, you have uh, different devices on that bus. So the first device that I already mentioned is this adapter that is used to translate the data from the sensors to a common communication protocol uh, for the bus. Um, this adapter collects the data from the sensor and stores it until it can send it on the bus, which it does after that. Then you also have a network master. The network master controls uh, everything that happens on the bus. Um, it handles who can send data, who cannot send data, and it configures like everything. Um, there is one master per network um, because if you had multiple masters, they would just interfere with each other in managing the network. And if you had no master, nobody could send the data because nobody would, or no um, sensor node would know what to do. The network master is also responsible for controlling the sensor nodes. Um, so uh, it also configures the sensor node or tells them to start or stop collecting the data and so on. Then a third role that a device can have on the bus is the so-called listener. The listener is used to collect data that is sent on the bus and it doesn't send any messages. It is just there to collect the data. It is also possible for nodes to have multiple roles like you can see here on the right. Um, a network master can also be a listener, which is typically the case because the network master on its own would not care about the data that is being transmitted on the bus and would just ignore it. So in a typical application, you would have a vehicle controller that is the network master and it's also a listener, so it can listen to the data. In our case, in the Swiss Loop case, we also have a second listener, which is the inverter, because uh, the inverter needs to uh, know some of the data that is produced by the sensors like velocity and position data or especially velocity data because it has to control the motor accordingly according to the velocity of the vehicle. So let's continue with the communication protocol that is used for this architecture. The communication protocol that I decided to use is the controller area network with flexible data rate, short CANFD. It was developed in 2011 by Bosch for automotive application. Today it is used for driver assistance systems in cars. Um, it is also used for systems like airbags and uh, engine control and some uh, things like that. So it is developed especially for vehicles, for the conditions you have in vehicles and so on. The protocol itself is a multi-master protocol in the sense that multiple um, nodes can send on the same bus without causing the bus to fail um, because there are some bus architectures that would just cause short circuit or corrupt the data if multiple nodes were to send their data at the same time and the controller area network uh, controller yeah the CAN um, protocol handles this by arbitration based on a message priority 
Um, what this means, uh, I'll show you in a few uh, seconds. It also can send up to 64 bytes of data payload, which is uh, a good size for sensor data. <clears throat> and it also has a cycle redundancy check. For those who don't have a electrical engineering background, a cycle redundancy check is a mechanism to detect errors in your message. So it is possible that some of the message bits get flipped, um, which would cause the data to be corrupted. And to detect this, you add just a sequence of ones and zeros at the end of the message, <clears throat> which can be used to check if the data was uh, transmitted correctly or not. So what you can see here is what the a typical message of the communication protocol looks like. You begin with the start of frame to indicate that the message is about to be transmitted. After that comes an arbitration field, <clears throat> which contains the identifier of the message and handles who can send the data on the bus and who not, because it is handled in a way that if two um, nodes try to send a message at the same time, the one with the higher priority wins. So all the nodes uh, also listen to the bus while sending a message. And if they detect that another message is being sent because there is something sent on the bus which they didn't send themselves, they can detect that another one is sending and the one with the higher priority wins the arbitration and the other one just stops sending until it, <clears throat> the bus is idle again. So after the arbitration field, there is a control field that is used uh, to transmit information about the message that is to be sent, um, like the amount of data that is to be sent and other configurations. Then there is the data field where the data is sent, after that the cycle redundancy check, and in the end, the acknowledgement. So another feature of the controller area network is that it has a flexible data rate, um, <clears throat> that each, which means that in the, at the middle of the control field, it can start uh, sending data with a higher data rate. Uh, for the standard version of the CANFD protocol, this means that <clears throat> the start of frame arbitration field and first part of the control field are sent with up to one megabits per second. The data cycle redundancy check and uh, the first few bits of the acknowledgement field are sent with up to five megabits per second. And the acknowledgement bit and the end of frame is sent at one megabit per second again. So here you can see what a typical transmission looks like. At the beginning, you have the <clears throat> start of frame bit here. In this case, the, uh, a node is trying to transmit the message, which means it sends a low signal to indicate the start. After that is the arbitration field where the identifier of the message is sent, which is followed by a control field that contains the information about the message. In this case, it is nine bits long. <clears throat> and as you can see here, the pulses get, uh, keep getting shorter here because the data rate is switched to a faster data rate. And the data field here in this example is six byte wide or 84 bits. And as you can see, it is sent in a shorter time frame than the 11 bits of the arbitration field because it is sent at five times the speed. <clears throat> After that, you have the CRC field, which, which is used to as I said, uh, check the data for correctness. <clears throat> and at the end, in an acknowledgement bit, which is sent by the master, indicating that it received the message and that it has also calculated the same CRC field. <clears throat> so let's continue with the arbitration layers of the sensor network. The bottom layer of the sensor network is the physical layer, and the next layer is the data link layer. The physical layer consists of uh, the sensor interface hardware on one side, which is defined by electrical characteristics um, like cable length, um, cable impedance, uh, termination resistors, um, voltage levels, and things like that. On top of that is the CANFD transceiver, CANFD is a protocol which uses differential communication, which is especially useful in uh, harsh environments where we have a lot of electromagnetic interference um, and a differential protocol can handle errors um, caused by 
EMI better. Um, and then you have the Canopy Core, which handles the data link layer and part of the physical layer. <clears throat> the Canopy Core is a part of a microcontroller, which is um, hardwired, which means it is hardware um, that is especially designed for CAN communication. And uh, therefore we have reached the, the border between hardware and software, because on top of the link layer, um, there is the hardware abstraction layer. Uh, this is a layer which is provided by a chip manufacturer. In the case of my sensor network, this is uh, the STM hardware abstraction layer. The hardware abstraction layer is used to interact with the hardware, um, configure the CAN core, um, add messages to the sending queue, receive messages, handle errors of the network and so on. On top of that is the network layer. The network layer is used to send the messages specifically for the <clears throat> sensor network itself. Uh, the network layer also handles time synchronization. <clears throat> time synchronization is important because uh, if you have multiple sensors, um, they all have their own local time because every microcontroller has its own oscillator and oscillators uh, are in general not every oscillator is uh, as fast as every other oscillators. You might know that from your own watches or things like that because uh, after a few days, weeks or months they start uh, running behind or are too fast by a few seconds. Um, for microcontroller this is a bit worse because most internal oscillators have a drift of about 1%. This means if you have two nodes it is possible that at worst case after 100 milliseconds one node might be a one millisecond faster or slower than the other node. And to take this to the extreme, after uh, 100 seconds or 200 seconds, this drift <clears throat> can be up to one or two seconds. And if you have uh, data being to evaluate everything. In addition to that, there are also sensors that don't sample their data regularly, but they are uh, caused by events. So for example, if you have a, a sensor that detects if the brake is engaged or not, you, want, you might want to know when the brake was engaged. So you need to generate a timestamp, which is uh, the same timestamp or system time for every node in the system. Another task of the network layer is address management. Uh, as I told you before, the CAN messages have identifiers which are used <coughs> to, uh, for the priority of the message. And uh, in order to, for the system, for the CAN network to work correctly, every node needs to have their, uh, needs to send different message addresses or identifiers so that the priority management can work. And for that, every node needs to have their own unique address. And the network master is responsible for distributing these addresses. And in case of the sensor nodes, the network layer just takes the address that it was assigned and sends data or um, everything that it sends to the bus with this address. So on top of the network layer, there is a session layer. The session layer is used for everything for every communication or every transaction that requires multiple messages to be sent. To give you an example here, um, in this case, the, in this example, the master sends a command request. This could be, for example, that the <clears throat> um, sensor needs to be restarted. Um, and in this case, it would just send this command request. Um, and in a, after a command request, the sensor node would send an acknowledgement and a callback after that. So in case of uh, restarting the sensor, this would mean that first the master sends uh, the, to a specific sensor node that it needs to restart its sensor. Then the node acknowledge, acknowledges that the sensor needs to be restarted and that it received the request and it can either deny or follow the the request 
and after it has fulfilled that request, as in the example, this would be restarting a sensor, it sends a callback that it has finished. And the session layer would in this case just um, make sure that this happens in the correct order, that it detects if a message doesn't get sent or react if a command is uh, unknown or um, is denied or something like that. What you can see, also can see here is a, is a 32 requests being sent after another. And um, as you can see here, the, before the first request is answered by an acknowledgement and a callback, there is a second command request sent because the sensor node can only start to begin uh, to handle this uh, command request after a certain time, but it, hasn't, it doesn't have the answer ready until a second command request is sent. But by then it has its answer ready, so it sends its answer. And at the same time, as you can see by this small line here, the master uh, also already tries to send its third message, but because of the message arbitration and because, that the, because of the higher priority of an acknowledgement message, it cannot send another request. So the transmit node, uh, the node can transmit its acknowledgement first. And after it has sent the acknowledgement for the first message, it also sends the acknowledgement for the second message that it received. And after that, the two callbacks for the message. After that, the first two transmissions are completely finished and the master can send the next. And this repeats until all 32 um, of the command requests are handled. So to come back to the uh, abstraction layers, the session layer also has a timeout detection. This timeout detection is used to detect if a sensor stops sending data or is disconnected from the bus or something like that because it is really important in a vehicle to know when the sensor fails. And um, if a sensor fails, it would, this could mean that um, something disconnected, something fell off, uh, which is really dangerous for a vehicle. On top of the session layer, there is an interface layer. The interface layer is used for sensor configuration. In case of a network master, this would mean this is the layer that is responsible for configuring sensor networks um, as desired for a sensor node. This means uh, that it stores the configuration that is sent by the master and um, <clears throat> collects the data from the sensor according to this configuration. These three layers together are the sensor interface software, which is <clears throat> which is the software that is sent uh, which is the software that is written for this network architecture. On top, on top of these layers are, is the user layer. The user layer is the software that is written by the user uh, in case of a network master or in case of a listener. This would be um, how to configure the sensors for the network master or what to do with the data in case of a listener. So should it, for example, uh, log the data or transmit it somewhere else or stop the vehicle because something is out of order and things like that. In case of a sensor node, the user layer is the interaction with the sensor. There are some uh, standard routines that are pre-written like, like uh, accessing the analog digital converter. Um, if it is just uh, analog data that needs to be read out. Um, but for most digital sensors, it is more complex to communicate with the sensor, so there is an extra layer that handles the communication with the sensor itself. Um, the software is divided into multiple layers, so if you desire to, for example, exchange the uh, communication protocol from CANFD to UART or SPI or something like that, you wouldn't have to rewrite every single layer, you just have to rewrite the network layer and exchange all the layers uh, below by the other communication uh, protocol. So let's continue with some hardware. Um, as you can see here, this is the adapter PCB that I mentioned before. The PCB is 17 millimeters by uh, 45 millimeters, which is about the size of half a finger. In the middle of the PCB on the top side is the microcontroller, which handles the communication and everything. Um, 
the microcontroller itself is seven by seven millimeters large. Next to it is a programming header uh, used to program and debug uh, this adapter PCB. Then you have the CANFD transceiver that uh, translates the signals from the microcontroller to the differential communication on the bus itself. Um, here you have the connector for the bus, one's on the top side and on the bottom side, where the bus cable can be connected. Uh, then you also have on the other side the connector to the sensor. There is one pin used for the supply voltage of the sensor, one for ground and one for a voltage reference. The voltage reference is uh, here. The voltage reference produces a stable 2.5 volts um, as a reference for analog sensors or <clears throat> as a supply for, um, for example, uh, thermistors. Then you have here five connectors for the sensors um, that can be either analog or digital signals. Um, and on the bottom side, you have filters for these signals before they are relayed to the chip itself. In addition to that, you have three LEDs uh, that indicate the status of the board that can also be used by the user to uh, indicate things about the sensor. So next we have uh, all the uh, interfaces, interface possibilities of the sensor network itself. A single sensor board can interface with a digital sensor that has a SPI communication. It can be either a master or a slave in that communication. It is also capable of communicating with a USART or UART sensor, a I2C sensor, a full or half duplex RS485 sensor, and it also supports two timers um, which can be used in encoder mode. Uh, an encoder is a sensor that is used to keep track of uh, distance or velocity. Uh, it, the input channels can also be used for up to four timer channels which can capture uh, the local time uh, in case of an interrupt or uh, generate an output at a specific time so sensors could be synchronized, for example. Uh, on the other hand, you can also use the inputs as external interrupts to uh, act accordingly uh, on a specific event of the sensor or just use them as GPIOs to if a sensor needs configuration GPIOs. The sensor can also uh, be used as an analog interface. Turkey can be, uh, they can be connected to a 12-bit ADC channel each. Um, each channel hand can be up to 5 million samples per second and can be um, overlooked by an analog watchdog, uh, which means that you can detect uh, faster if uh, the sensor would be, would stop working or if the signal of the sensor would get out of range. Additionally, there is a comparator which can be used with an internal or external reference um, and two op amps which can <coughs> use the uh, negative terminal provided either by the digital analog converter of the chip itself or can just amplify a differential signal. <coughs> so this is everything the board has to offer. Uh, this would be the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, you can uh, ask them on Slido. Uh, here's the link again. You can use the event code listed here. Uh, I saw that there are a few things written in the chat. So I guess I start with them. Uh, Alfred has a question. Yeah. I can also moderate them. As okay. I do you want to ask uh, the questions and yes, because I then we, also, we always have it on the recording afterwards. Okay. Um, yes, should we? Yes, and let's start with the one in the in the chat. Um, the first question is, what performance levels required PLR, PLR were resulting from your risk assessments for your safety relevant sensors? Um, I didn't do a specific risk assessment for safety relevant sensors. Um, we just assign sensors that are safety relevant for systems that are crucial for correct operation of the pod. 
Um, for example, if you have a, a braking system, you need to know the pressure in the brakes um, because you need to know if there is a leakage in the brake because if there was a leakage, you couldn't brake anymore. Um, so you have to activate uh, secondary braking mechanisms before it is too late. Um, it is also important for control of the pot that you know the velocity because for example, the inverter needs to know the velocity of the vehicle so it can um, control the motor accordingly. Is that a setting fire, setting fire uh, response or uh, did you mean something else or? Hello, Luca. Thank you so much, uh, appreciate. I was uh, just thinking about the selection of performance level required from A, B, C, D, or E, highest one versus the ones then at the end of the day you effectively realized. And uh, how did you compare the two of them, the, the required ones versus the realized ones? And of course, at the end of the day, how did you try to validate these uh, performance levels as built? Um, okay, I guess this is a thing from mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm not aware of these performance levels assessments or risk assessments. Uh, we just determined which sensors are uh, safety relevant um, from if they were to fail, we would have to know to be able to stop the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we move on to the second question in the chat. Um, what PL did you realize? Uh, I guess that's the same question. <laughs> Still the... Yeah, um, as I said, I'm not aware of this performance mm. Uh, and risk assessment concept that you uh, ask question about here. Yeah, no problem. It's all coming out of ISO uh, 13849 minus 1, 13841, 49 minus 1, looking at safety relevant parts of control systems, just for your reference. Okay, okay, okay no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Luca. Well, uh, the system is designed for a, it's just a student project. It is not uh, yet um, designed as a system that would be used in uh, for pu public transport. So we, uh, yeah, we don't have time and resources to uh, specifically care about all these uh, ISO standards yet. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Okay, and I guess the third question in the in the chat um, it applies the same, Luca. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Then we move on to the questions in on Slido. Then the first question is, and the architecture with different layers you talked about. How do you define and choose the order? Is this a general procedure? Okay, I guess we go back to this slide here. Um, the layers. Uh, some layers are predefined. It all comes from the OC model that is uh, some of you might know from the Ethernet uh, or internet stack. Um, in this case, the data link layer and physical layer are defined by the ISO standard, standard for the CANFD. And all the others layer are just um, like similar to um, uh, the this OC reference model, but are not, not quite the same because the OC, uh, OC layer stack is pretty general and uh, the, the, the reason we use this specific sensor network is to be more efficient and uh, completely separated layers are not extremely efficient. So the layers are a bit reduced. So we uh, I use fewer layers than the OC reference model. They have a bit uh, another function than the OC model itself. Um, but it is easier to divide them in like functional blocks that you need to 
to do. If you have uh, everything just written in one layer, the code gets really messy. So it's easier to pass information between different layers um, yeah, to, to, to keep everything clean, to keep functional blocks separated and so on. Okay, thank you. I hope that's a satisfying answer. Um, but I suggest we start from the bottom of the questions. Yeah, they, they always change a bit because people are upvoting. Oh, okay. But, okay, so I, I now go to the one standing on top. Um, what are the biggest EMI issues you encountered when building last year's pot? So uh, EMI, uh, or for those who don't know what EMI is, it is electromagnetic interference. And electromagnetic interference happens everywhere where you switch uh, a lot of current. In case of our vehicle or our pod, this was a, uh, mainly in the motor or in the inverter itself, where you switch um, DC current on and off multiple times, multiple thousand times per second. Um, and this generates a lot of electromagnetic interference. Uh, so the biggest EMI issue we had uh, in our in last year's pod was in the inverter itself. On the other systems, it or especially on my system, it didn't have uh, quite that much of an effect. It was still noticeable because some of the analog signals were also corrupted um, by EMI, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, but we tried to do it better this year. Um, and just design everything uh, more EMI resistant than last year. Okay. Then the next question is, have you evaluated the influence of the limbs magnetic field on the analog sensor signals in your previous star top topology? Um, so with analog sensors, there are multiple different analog sensors. Uh, there are, for, uh, for example, sensors that have a voltage output and sensors that have a current output. Um, from this perspective, analog sensors with a voltage output are, um, have a bigger problem with EMI uh, and the magnetic fields and so on. So we used um, current output sensors from the beginning, which are, uh, yeah, have less of a problem with that. And also we didn't use analog sensors near uh, the limb itself, uh, near the magnetic field, um, just not to get into a situation where this would be a problem. Um, we also did simulations for the sensors that were really close uh, to the limb itself, like the limb distance sensors that we have to uh, check the, the position of the limb, the air gap width, and so on. But we didn't have uh, a problem with them. And all other sensors are far enough away from the limb itself that the stray um, magnetic field isn't a problem. Or okay. is at least not as bad as EMI from the inverter. <laughs> okay. Then um, somebody would like to know, is it C you use to program the firmware um, are there any alternatives to C? Uh, yes, I use C um, uh, to program everything because it's just the uh, like the standard for embedded uh, embedded applications. It would also be possible to use C++, but um, I just use C because I uh, am more accustomed to that. Um, other programming languages have, or many programming languages that I know of have uh, more overhead than C. And for the project, it is, uh, yes, enough to write everything in C. Okay, thank you. Then somebody um, is wondering, how did you design EMI resistance, better shielding or redundancies, um, slash other cables, slash signals? Um, well, we last year we didn't put a lot of effort into shielding. We made sure that all the cables are shielded, um, but we didn't check if the shielding was uh, done um, perfectly. 
most of the analog signals were shielded, um, but there is always a short connection between the, the cable and the connector where things are not shielded or on the PCBs themselves, not everything is shielded. Um, so we try to uh, sometimes shield uh, PCBs, so we have less EMI problems there. Um, we also try to use more differential signals. Uh, to give an example, the communication in the inverter itself between the different modules um, that uh, drive the inverter uh, wasn't differential last year. And this was a big problem because EMI sometimes corrupted the data transmission um, or uh, just uh, caused interrupts to happen when they shouldn't happen and things like that. So um, yes, the CAN protocol is um, more EMI resistant than many other protocols because on one hand is, it is differential. Um, differential protocols are more resistant to EMI than non-differential protocols. Um, also, the CAN has um, CAN protocol has this CRC, uh, the cyclic redundancy check, uh, that is a that is used to detect bit flips um, of up to. Uh, I'm not quite sure there. I guess it's I think it's something like nine or ten bit flips in a row that it can detect. Um, so that's yeah, that this adds more uh, EMI resistance. Okay, then the next question is, um, are you using a standard high-level communication protocol for the upper layers or did you develop a custom solution? Yes, that's similar to the second question we had um, uh, about the network layers themselves. So um, I did some research into higher-level communication protocols that are written on top of the of top of CANFD, but because um, CANFD is relatively new to the, the wider industry, not all the higher, commonly used higher level protocols uh, are compatible with CANFD, and many of them are limited in bitrate because they have a standard bitrate. Uh, many of them use uh, 125 uh, kilobits per second or 500,000 kilobits per second, um, which is kind of slow compared to the five megabits per second that is possible with CANFD. Um, also, it is mm, uh, often more efficient um, to write a specific solution for a problem instead of using a general solution for a problem. Because the sensor network in case of our sensor, uh, in a case of our pod needs to to handle uh, a lot of data and really fast and many protocols, uh, high level protocols have a lot of overheads combined with them. Uh, also, you have to make sure that like the whole uh, protocol fits onto the microcontroller because you have a limited storage space of uh, half a megabyte, uh, which is not <laughs> really much if you, yeah, uh, for a ton of code. So, just to summarize this, uh, it is on one hand more efficient to write a, uh, a high level protocol for a specific task than for a general task. And uh, there wasn't a, or I didn't find a high level protocol which specifically did what we need to uh, have for our sensor uh, network. Okay. And then there is one final question. What can you do if you receive many false CRCs in a row? Well, if you receive a wrong CRC, what the uh, CAN bus itself does is it sends a um, error message. Um, the error message, um, well, for to answer that, I have to go a bit deeper into the protocol. The protocol itself has something called bit stuffing, which means that after five bits of the same polarity, also, so um, like five zeros or five ones in a row, it adds another bit of opposite polarity, um, which means after five zeros, there would be an additional one 
uh, before the rest of the data is transmitted. So the can, of, can protocol makes use of that um, in a sense that if it sees that something is wrong on the bus in case uh, like a wrong CRC or an, a message is not acknowledged or something like that, it sends an error message and every node uh, sees if a error message is being transmitted by another node. So uh, the node that is currently sending a message when an error message is being sent uh, can detect that and it has an internal error counter. Uh, on every um, fault, bus fault that happens during a transmission, the, this error counter is increased and if it reaches a certain level, the CAN core shuts off communication to the bus. This means that uh, faulty nodes, nodes are isolated uh, so that other nodes which are not faulty and send the correct CRCs can still send. Another effect that would happen if too many CRCs uh, were false or too many messages didn't, uh, weren't correctly formatted or something like that, the timeout detection would kick back in from the session layer and we would see that some sensors or all sensors are no longer responding and you could detect that there is an error on the bus but there is nothing that you can actively do to, uh, to uh, compensate many wrong CRCs in a row, especially if it happens for multiple milliseconds or seconds. Okay, then somebody had an, an additional question. I think it's quite interesting. So let's do this as the final question. Are there budget design limitations? How could you potentially improve moving forward? Yes, uh, let's start with design limitations. Um, so you always want to be, uh, to have your product uh, small and cheap. <laughs> um, in my case, as I mentioned, the PCB itself is 17 millimeters by 45 millimeters, which is quite small. Um, it is also pretty lightweight. I can't give you an exact number, but it's just a few dozen grams at most. I guess it would be around 20 grams at most. So it is about as heavy as the cable that uh, connects to the sensor. Um, which in case of, if you want to build a lightweight vehicle, um, weight is an important uh, factor. So uh, the, um, the linear bus topology is also a, a topology that is lighter in, in general. Um, but it has the downside that it slightly brings up cost. Um, the fact that we have is that, yeah, cable is also not that cheap. So from rough calculations, I guess that the, the, the amount of cable that we save um, is about, has about the same cost that we need to uh, replace that cable by these additional PCBs. Um, for the sensor interfaces. Um, additional design limitations are uh, like speed. Um, this is one of the reasons why I didn't use other high level protocols because they are a bit slower. And at the beginning we did some rough calculations of how, many, uh, how much data we need to transmit over the network. And we saw that um, transmission speeds of 125 kilobits per second or 500,000 kilobits per uh, 500 kilobits per second wasn't enough to meet these requirements. Um, and budget limitations, I guess I kind of answered that before with the cost. Um, so for a size of 10 to 20 boards, the cost would be around 20 to 30 uh, Swiss francs for um, a single board which is about, what's that, 25 euros, um, something like that, um, which is not exactly free, but it's not that expensive either. And um, also it depends on which components you add to the board. Uh, as an example, if you only use digital communications, you don't need a voltage reference and you can leave that part out. Or if you don't use uh, RS, RS485, you don't need the RS485 transceiver, so you can 
save another two to three francs there. Yeah. So you can adjust the boards depending on what you really need on them. Okay, well, thank you, Luca. Thank you for um, answering all the questions and also thank you very much for your time for the input talk. It was very interesting to have a look into your your area of expertise in the Swiss Loop team. Um, thank you very much for this. Of course, it was a pleasure. <laughs>